So about four years ago, Kristen and the kids and I went to Big Bend National Park with some friends. It's right in the middle of COVID, and we had to get out of Abilene. And so uh, we could go, and you could still go into the national parks at that point, and it was kind of impulsive. And I want to take you to the moment we are driving home. It's about 11 o'clock at night. And if you've ever driven north out of Big Bend at 11 o'clock at night, uh, you know, you're going to know what I'm talking about. It's this blessed, otherworldly experience. All around you feels like alien terrain, and there's just this lone highway. It is peaceful, but also kind of disruptive feeling. You're, you're about 200 miles away from anyone that could help if something went wrong. And, and me and Kristen and the kids are in our car, and we're following behind our friend's minivan. And um, you know how, like, some family vacations are just like one string of disasters? Yeah? Okay. You're not laughing. You, good for you. Sometimes our family vacations are just one long string of disasters. But this one wasn't. This one was just good, and we were connecting. We were seeing amazing parts of God's creation. And as I'm following my friend Chris in their their minivan in front of us, I'm just kind of in this mode of of gratitude. It's just everything is kind of beautiful. And that's when I see Chris's minivan kind of go, and then they pull over, and we, you know, slow down, pull up behind them, and they had just completely run over a deer, in the middle of the night. And luckily, everyone was fine, and there was no accident or anything, and we were, um, like, removing the part of Chris's minivan that's the step up to the, to the driver's side. And we decided that we we're just going to leave it there, because that seemed, I don't know, what else are you going to do? And I asked Chris, you know, are you, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm fine, but uh, I think you're going to lead now. And I said, that this totally, seems totally reasonable. And so we get back on the highway, and we're going forward, and it's just a sea of darkness. But Now a new emotion has entered my heart, which is fear. And I start thinking about all the scenarios that could happen as my family continues to sit back in the back of the car, just peacefully ignorant of all my anxiety. What happens if uh, we blow a tire? Okay, we've got a spare. What happens if we blow two tires? I think we're spending the night on this highway. I think that's what's happening right now. And I just kind of became aware in that moment of the bigness of creation and where I was in it. And I felt afraid. But it wasn't just pure fear. It wasn't just panic. There's a reverence there in that moment. It's hard to be where we were and not feel in awe of God and what God can do and how small I am compared to all of it. Driving that night with just our headlights showing the way on a dark highway where everything else around us is mysterious. That felt like reverent fear. And this is the same thing that Peter tells the exiles of dispersion to go through life feeling. While you're exiles in dispersion, be in reverent fear of the one that you invoke as father. Because he has not ransomed you with with meaningless, perishable things. And we might expect him to say after that, you know, like garbage or money. Gold and silver are perishable, meaningless things compared to what you have been ransomed with, the precious blood of Jesus. And it's this word ransom that I think we need to slow down and spend a little time on. This word ransom brings in a field of what we'll call thought that can seem highly academic, and it can seem uh, pretty disconnected from maybe where we live our lives day-to-day as Christians, but it's not. This field I'm talking about is called atonement. And I'm looking over here because I was hoping Al Campbell would be here today, and he's not, because I was teaching a men's Bible class a couple of Tuesdays ago, and I said, guys, I want to talk about atonement. Do you have any idea what atonement means? And Al Campbell just, you know, very quietly and subdued, um, <laughs> yelled out, 
my favorite definition of atonement because you can spend hours talking about what atonement actually means. But Al just yells out, at one minute. And if you can see it, the word atonement, you can break it up into three parts. At one minute. Atonement is how God brings humanity together with God. How God makes God and humanity one. I'm really sad Al Campbell's not here today because, I mean, he would have just, I didn't prepare him. He would have nailed that, you know, line just perfectly, but too bad. Um, Al, if you're joining us online, you should feel bad about yourself right now. (laughs) Totally ruined this moment. How exactly does God make life with God possible for us? Most Christian traditions will share this kind of unified idea that there is a great distance between divinity and humanity. That doesn't need much explanation. We can, in our, in our lived experience, just feel, we don't always feel all that close to God. And so how exactly does God make us one with God? Again, that can feel highly academic and distant, but here's where I think it matters. What you think of God shapes a lot of what you think God does. And so if God is a distant, angry father figure sitting in the clouds waiting for you to mess up, your view of how God does the work of salvation and atonement through Jesus is going to look a lot like judgment. It's going to look like a God who we say is full of unconditional love is actually at the mercy of our own actions. The most popular, I'm going to try to give this as much credit as I can, though I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think it's got much worth. The most popular theory of atonement in our culture goes something like this. The world is screwed up and humans are bad. God cannot be around humans because they are so bad. However, the God of the Israelites, who established a rigid and comprehensive system of sacrifice, sent his son into the world to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Once and for all, for all of those who believe in him. In a, in a sentence, the blood of Jesus appeases a God who is otherwise displeased with us. Does that seem fair? Maybe you might even be hearing that and say, like, what's wrong with that? I mean, David, even in Scripture, we're heard, we hear that Jesus is an atoning sacrifice, and he is. There is a lot that is left to be desired in that view, what I would call the dominant view of atonement in our culture. And it has serious problems with the way that we show up as exiles to our culture. It has serious issues with the way we show up as transformative love of Jesus to our neighbors. A good way to test a theory of atonement is to ask it two sides of the same question. What does it save you from? What does it promise to save you from, and what does it promise to save you to? We're going to start with what it promises to save you from. And what I would throw out there is that the dominant theory of atonement in our culture doesn't promise to save us from much. I would give us the image of somebody who has fallen off of a boat in the middle of the ocean. And this view of atonement is like a lifeline. And you're thrown out there and... This view of atonement promises to not let you drown. It will always just help you keep your nose and your mouth right above the waterline. But that's it. It's not going to take you to shore. It's not going to set your feet on solid ground. It's not going to help you live life abundantly. This view of atonement is always going to only forgive you for the bad things that you have done and you have said. It's going to keep you from drowning. Absent is any sort of hope of a human connection with the divine. This view of atonement appeases an otherwise angry God. 
and you don't get sent to hell. There is no concept of living in the kingdom of God here and now, living a life of fullness and abundance and beauty and mystery. The problem with this view of atonement isn't that it saves you from the bad things you do and think, what I would call lowercase s sin. It does that. It just is not very full. It only does that. It only saves us from our own bad inclinations. Um, I think we need a better understanding of what God has saved us from. I think we need a fuller picture of a God who actually thinks quite highly of us, of a God who actually invites us to participate in the transformation of the world in which we live. The problem is how little it promises to save us from. What does it save us to? Well, it promises to save us um, to an idea of non-distance. That's weird, right? It promises to save us to um, a, a place where we don't do much damage to the world. The problem with both what it saves us from and what it saves us to isn't wrong. It's just not full. It doesn't bring us to be a church that transforms the world for the love of God where we live. And so, what's a better image? This morning, I want to focus on the from. What is a better image of what it saves us from? And at first, I'm going to warn you what First Peter promises the ransom of Jesus saves us from is a little bit shocking. If you go back and you read more carefully, 1 Peter promises that the ransom of Jesus, the pure, unblemished blood of Christ, saves us from our own families. You have been ransomed from the corrupt ways of your ancestors. It reminds me of that really harsh moment in Luke's gospel where Jesus says, if you don't reject, if you don't hate your own father and mother, you cannot be my disciple. That's a hard word. That's a hard word. I am okay, like, in my mind with First Peter calling the first century Christians, their, their families of, of origin. I'm, I'm fine with Peter calling them pagans because, like, in a, in a distant sort of way, they are. You know, they worshiped the, the Roman pantheon of gods. And yeah, they're pagans. I'm fine with that. But remember Peter's own story. Peter, who was a good Jewish boy, is the man who famously had to be visited with several visions from God to give him the permission to go to a Roman soldier Cornelius' house, and baptize every single one of this pagan person's family because he could not deny that the Holy Spirit was not already on this man and his family. Peter, who famously betrayed the religion of his youth by leading the new church to eat with pagans, to even eat food sacrificed to their pagan gods for the sake of the love of Christ that they intended to offer the Gentiles. Peter himself had to rely on Judaism to introduce him to Jesus. And then at a point had to deny Judaism to keep following Jesus. At a certain point, Peter had to reject the teaching of those who loved him in the faith, who nurtured him, who brought him up. And he even is consistent because he feels, with his own experience, perfectly fine saying to the Gentile Christians in Asia Minor, let go of the pagan teachings of your 
parents. Because it's a very human thing to be taught in love something that is not true. We have all been taught by people who have loved us and in loving ways taught us things that we must reject at some point to continue following Jesus. At some point, to follow the one Peter says we invoke as Father. We have to reject the people who taught us the things that made us who we are. Because you have not been ransomed just from bad things. You have been ransomed from good things that are not yet godly things. You have been ransomed from things that helped you be successful. You have been ransomed from the patterns of thought that were taught to you by the people that loved you most because they were good but not yet God. Being a follower of Jesus today, as in the first century in Asia Minor, means totally starting over. John said it well as he was talking about Philippians. Being conformed to Christ means embracing the death of Christ. We shouldn't be surprised that our ransom means a total starting over. And that is hard. It is hard when life is uncertain and you can no longer rely on what got you here. It is so much easier just to turn back, just to go back to where it's safe because at least, at least it got you to this place where you were introduced to Jesus. But at some point, all religion, all human structures have to be let go of for the sake of following Jesus all the way. It can be really intimidating to hear God talk about ransoming you with a great price because it actually means that God thinks quite highly of us. It actually means that God is inviting you to really participate in the transformation of the world for the love of Christ. It can be scary to go forward, and I think sometimes this is why churches have such a difficult time actually being good news to their neighborhood. It's easy to talk good news. It is hard for churches to become gospel where they are. I think the shift is this. I think we have to discover we are kind of driving on a dark and empty highway. And the only thing lighting our path is just some, some weak headlights. We can't see all that far in front of us. We can't know what is after the next step. We only know what is right in front of us. But because of Christ, we do know what is right in front of us. We often can know the next right step. We often don't know the second step, but we often can know the next right step because as Peter says, Christ is the one who has led you to trust in God. How do we know how to go forward? Jesus is knowable. Jesus has come to earth and made himself knowable. So much of life is a mystery. So much of life is unknowable. So much of life is uncertain. But church, we know Jesus. We can learn about Jesus. We can read about Jesus in our Bibles. We can Sit with Jesus now. Jesus promises to make a home in our hearts. It is possible to be intentional with our lives so that we know the one that leads us to God. The good news of our faith is that Jesus is just so knowable. And we will not always know what to do, but we can live in reverent 
fear going forward that Jesus will always show us the next step. We've been ransomed from things that sometimes we don't want to let go of. It's normal. But we can go forward because Jesus is so knowable. I want us to end in in a moment of kind of meditation because, because I think that's actually a way for me that's been quite helpful to know Jesus. Sounds mystical. I can't explain it. I think Jesus wants to make himself known to us. I think sometimes my prayer life has needed to be a lot less about me saying things to Jesus and a lot more about being quiet long enough to maybe, maybe hear from Jesus. Maybe Jesus might actually show me the way forward. I introduced a breath prayer, yes, last week. If you were here, you might remember it. If not, I'm going to reintroduce it. But I'm going to, I'm going to stop with this. I'm going to say my, the blessing I tend to say, and then I'm going to ask us to close our eyes. You can close your eyes now if you want. And, and just sit in a moment with this breath prayer that I'm going to r- remind us of. John will lead us out of that. It's not going to be too terribly long. But see if you can't internalize this small practice of trusting that Jesus is leading you to God. So church, this week, may you follow Jesus. May you look for Jesus and see that he just a abundantly makes, wants to make himself known to you. May the peace of our Lord Jesus go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. So church, the breath prayer is this. We breathe in, God, you are my hope and my salvation. We breathe out, I place my trust in you. We breathe in, we say, God, you are my hope and my salvation. We breathe out, we say, I put my trust in you. You are my hope and my salvation. I put my trust in you.